Hello, world. Welcome back. Welcome. <laughs> it's good. <laughs> it's, I think it's working. Uh, my name's Christina, for anyone that doesn't know me, and I have my lovely friend, Bill Saxaby, with us here today. Hello. Uh, Bill is an amazing steady cam operator, and we met in New York City a couple years back now, I believe. Mm -hmm was the first thing we worked on together the um, um Brittany runs a marathon i think so yeah for uh, yes yes it was and then for anyone who doesn't know it's available on amazon <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah bill can you start us off with telling the folks at home uh how you got into the film business and like what your first job on set was yeah sure um so again my name is bill saxelby hello um so yeah, I had always just been a fan of movies when I was a kid and everybody always asked like, you know, what was like the Akira Kurosawa movie that really made you want to get into stuff? And I was like, it was actually Batman by Tim Burton. It was his, it was his Batman that I was just obsessed with as a kid and I just loved the graphic design of it and just that movie was like, you know, my, my, my Bible grown up. Like I just, I would watch that movie. I wore out the VHS, you know, tracking lines all over. Um, but yeah, so I got into the film industry, um, because I wanted to make movies, uh, and for a long time, I just, I had wanted to be a DP, I wanted to be a shooter, but I realized that I actually enjoyed more of being able to have a craft to hone, uh, that was specific, and, um, I learned that early on when I got into the industry, starting as a camera PA, finally able to actually see a DP on the grand scale and just be like, you know what, that's, I don't think that's actually what I want to get into. And so, um, yeah, I started my way up as a, a camera. I was actually just a set PA. Um, I worked my way from a production office on this Nicole Hall Center movie called, um, oh, not They Came Together. That was another movie I did. But anyway, um, went from an office PA to a set PA on that. And then I just befriended the camera department, you know, just kind of saw when there was an appropriate opportunity, um, when they weren't busy, where I could just kind of sidle up and just introduce myself, say, you know, I'm interested in cameras. This is what I want to do. Um, and then they actually on that same job ended up uh, propositioning the uh, AD department and folded me into their camera PA. Oh, that's great. Um, so yeah, so then I became a camera PA went back to school for two more years because uh, I was just on a summer job uh, and this, that was in New York. And then uh, when I graduated, my wife and I moved, then girlfriend, moved from uh, Austin to New York um, and yeah, just kind of grounded out doing camera PA work. I hit up everybody that I met that, that one summer and I had one AC named Brett Walters who has been great to me, um, got back to me and uh, brought me on some music videos, some tear jobs, and then later on, um, I met uh, his then second, Scott Lipkowitz, who's a phenomenal guy, but um, we met on a movie together, and he threw my name out to uh, just another HBO show, spent a few more months camera peeing, and then they were like, we want to get you in the union, so um, put myself on the list, took the test, became a loader, uh, worked my way up as a loader for about four and a half years, and then as a second for about four years, uh, but always kind of had my eye on the prize of wanting to be an operator. And um, I really felt like it was funny. I, I just didn't, steady cam wasn't a thing at, for me at first. I was just going to be an operator, right? And then everybody looks at me, and I'm, I'm, for those of you who can't see, I mean, I'm six foot six, 230 pounds. So people are like, dude, you're huge. You should do this. It's probably like nothing for you. And I was like, well, you know, okay, I'll, I'll try it. And I remember trying on Maceo Bishop's rig and really actually enjoying it. And uh, so then I took the Steadicam course in 2014 in PA, the one that um, Garrett Brown offers through the SOA. Uh, and yeah, just really took a shine to that that specific camera craft and then that was that afforded me the ability that once I got my rig you know I had a specialized skill set that not everybody else on set has and so then I could come in as a day player let's say when I was moving up from because uh, I never first did because um, I was going to be terrible at it um, but so I it afforded me the ability to move from seconding to operating a little more fluidly because I could practice on uh 
you know, on a dolly with the wheels, uh, you know, on less high pressure, non A camera shots. If I was brought yeah. in as like a play play B camera, set a camera, you know, I could do my trick and then do a long lens thing and, you know, not have as much pressure as having to orchestrate a beautiful dolly move because that's just a whole nother skill set that you need. Cool. But uh, yeah, that's, those are kind of the broad strokes. Camera PA or PA to camera PA to loader second, then the set of camera. So it kind of came up through the, through the system. You're inspiration for us all. <laughs> <laughs> well, because I will say that though too, that there is a lot of people or there are a lot of people out there that want to just like, oh, I want to do this like right away. And what we do is a craft, you know, and you need to be able to sit and watch and listen and learn from just an amazing, like on set you have an encyclopedia of knowledge in front of you and just try not to, you know, waste it, waste your day on your phone. You know, ask questions with people that you just want to figure out something like, you know, ask the head techs while they're doing something this way or ask the dolly grips while they're doing this or the gaffer or, you know, even just the lamp operators. You know, it's just, it is a collective, you know, apprenticeship that we're all learning constantly. I'm constantly learning as I know you are. And I mean, it's just, uh, yeah, that's what really draws me to what we do is that it's a collaborative group effort and everybody can always teach you a new trick. Totally. I mean, that's what I find so fascinating is that, you know, as someone who also was inspired by movies and inspired by this like figurehead that is the cinematographer, there are still so many people that are part of the whole camera team, as well as the other people on set that are all collaborating for that cinematographer and the director to make that vision happen. Yeah. And uh, I was wondering if you could maybe specifically address that relationship that you have with cinematographers as someone who's you know, honing your own craft, but helping with their vision, you know, that, that inner yeah. way. So I always like to, um, you know, after I've gotten a job, I always like to kind of present myself as a blank slate, right? To just be like, hey, so I have some skills and I'll impart um, my, my visuals, taste and styles that I like, but this is about executing, you know, I am a, a technician at your disposal. You know what I mean? So I like to see what their style, their look is, and then I can feel free maybe a week, two weeks into a job that I can start making suggestions or, um, you know, even if they're just like, hey, just give me a wide shot and walk away. Like, that's when I feel like you've, you've entered into that, that second phase of the relationship where I always like to take it as, tell me what you like, and then I can interpret from there once, you, once our comfort levels have come up together, especially if it's the first time working together. Um, so it's always a fine line of just knowing that you're a role player, but, um, but a, a specific one. Um, but that, you know, you get some people where the ego comes into play as a camera operator, which I feel like is not the case. Like, I mean, you're there as part of the team and you got to help out. And, um, yeah. So I look at it as I get to help. I'm, I'm part of like an interpreter for a little bit. I'm a, I'm a, cog for them to use and then also I get to flex my creative muscle once there's a trust that develops mm -hmm. so I guess that's it is that um, I look at it as that relationship is all about building an initial trust um, and then being able to impart your own creative style as the job progresses would you that make sense? I don't know. No, it, it totally does. I'm just curious that, you know, where you are in your career, do you feel like with certain DPs, you have to like prepare to work with them? Like, do you ever like know you're getting a job and like, do your research on them? Or do you just like let that environment that you meet them and you build that trust and that just becomes its own thing? Well, I think it's a little bit of both, right? Um, I'll make sure to uh, watch their work and, and see what they like. Um, and to give myself more of a, to have a, at least a better jumping off point, right? So yeah. that I can try and be able to be in their head a little bit more when I show up to set the first day. But it's also all about like, you know, it's, it's not the bill show or anything like that. Like, you know, when you show up first day, it's just like, hey, you know, meeting you, it's like first day of school. Like, you know, we just want to be, I just want to get along and, and have fun and, you know, do this thing that we're both passionate about and do it responsibly and respectfully. Um, so I'll do my homework uh, to have sort of a framework in the back of my own mind. And then, um, and then I'll let that kind of permeate the first couple of days knowing that I think I know you're already wanting to go with this, but I'll let mm -hmm. you steer for a little bit 
and then kind of, you know, you can take the hands off the wheel a little bit. You can work on everything else then and trust that I'll make, that I will do this part for you uh, and be a, what I call just being a steward of the frame, you know? Yeah, um, that's awesome. I mean, I just, it's just so curious to me to think about how we all meet there, like that, that of all these minds that come together to make that happen, you know? And I'm just curious about, you know, if, people are doing their homework on you. Do you think that you as a, an operator have a certain aesthetic or style that as much as you, you, we all like, I think aim to be like stewards. Do you think that people perceive you in a certain way or your work? And then they're like, Oh, like, he's done this. So I, that's why I want him on this. Yeah. Uh, I would say that, you know, it's primarily just um, the precision with my specific tool, right. With the steady cam, like people would be like, Oh, you know, not, doesn't, not Bodhi, very rock solid, and, but is also, can, there's a fluidity to it. It doesn't feel robotic. It feels, you know, natural. Uh, I think that that would probably be the, the extent of it because my reel is more um, showing the, the people that I've worked with to, again, establish that trust level that if a producer or a DP or whomever's looking at that for the first time, be like, oh, so they've trusted, Bill's been with, you know, A, B, and C. Gotcha. So, like, all right, so he knows how to handle himself under a big name, right? And yeah. has performed in that field already. So I think that that's more of what it, if anybody was doing research on me, that would be it. You know, and then I think that there's also like, you know, as when I was coming up as an AC, there wasn't much of an interview process per se, right? Yeah. You're maybe referred to somebody or you guys have worked together day playing or something like that. Somebody appreciates your, um, your just generic hustle, good naturedness and says, Hey, I wouldn't mind being stuck in a room with you for 12 hours a day. Why don't you come be my second on this next job? Um, but now it's to, it's a more elevated position. So I'll have to go in and interview with the DP. And so I guess that this is kind of a, a mixing of all of the questions you've asked already is that like, in that point, it's a mutual feeling out process. I feel like the interview gotcha. where that comes out, um, where, Hey, you know, here, like somebody may ask, what is it? What, is, what are a couple of your favorite movies? What do you tend to like? Um, and I always, you know, one of my favorite visual movies, um, is Chinatown. I just love the way the camera moves and that everything was mainly on a 40 mil anamorphic. So the frames work within themselves. There's no need to chase the actors. Everything kind of has a, a set purpose, right? I like when things don't feel forced and that you have to, mm. you know, you don't always have to move with the actor, like let them move through the frame. Um, and so I guess that that's where your um, likes get teased out of you, I guess. Because they're, again, it, you know, the DP is the captain of the ship. But sometimes, like, you know, it was very, uh, the DP, one of the alternating DPs on the show I just finished, Lovecraft Country, uh, Michael Watson and I, uh, there was one um, setup where it was one of the characters answers a phone and has a conversation. And it was a long day. We'd already had two company moves and he was just gassed and was just like, what do you think? How do we do this? And so then I threw out an idea and he was like, I love that. That's how we're doing it. You know, and you get like, that's, that's where the bone gets thrown to you a little bit, you know, where there are times where, especially a director of photography has so much other things they have to think of. I mean, they have to be on top of the schedule of the day, you know, always three departments, sometimes five that they're in charge of. Um, just, you know, the three being camera, grip, and electric, uh, that, you know, after a while, I feel like, you know, that their creative abilities can just, you can get bogged down. And so yeah. then that's where they'll look to their, their operators and say, what's your thought on this? Yeah. And so then you can throw something out, which is either you get two reactions. That's, I love it, or I don't like that. Don't, don't suggest that anymore. <laughs> and well, you go, All right, yeah. I have to say, I feel like that's such a huge part of our industry and what makes this time that we're talking right now so much more relevant is this, this, th this theme of exhaustion, you know, yeah. and like how much you hustle in this whole industry in general is about hustle. And I was just curious if you could maybe talk a bit more about how you stayed, I mean, maybe like literally physically in shape with your craft, but also just like inspired, like when in, I hate to say normal, but 
pre-COVID days, you know, yeah. you're going between projects, like how you stay just energized. Yeah. Well, I mean, I always have to, um, there will always be moments like, especially if I'm on something long term, right? I won't, I'm not seeking out like going to a movie or something usually like that, because that just, that's like reminding me of work at that point, you know? Yeah. But so I always try to, um, like, it's actually, my wife's a big help with that a lot because she'll be like, you know what? I really wanted to see this. Um, what do you like? Can we, can we give this a watch? And I'm like, yeah, sure. Um, but it's, I think that that's, it's trying not to close yourself off from doing your own research too much and, you know, have a few weeks where you're just like, all right, I'm not watching anything new. I want to watch like the office or I just want to watch something that makes me feel good. Yeah. But then like the other night I finally watched, um, uh, what was it? Uh, Heredity. Have you seen that yet? Oh no, I don't think I have. Is it a horror movie? It is. Okay. Um, but it's an eight <laughs> uh, kind of sci-fi, like it's more of a, supernatural creepy gotcha. horror that it is jump out but it's a visually it's beautiful um and so it's finding the times to just to take a break i guess to, to answer your question better i think is more to just know when to pull back take a breath when you just have to like hey i just want to drink a beer and stare at the wall for a little bit so that you can then the next day be like you know what i really want to watch i heard somebody talking about this um, and I really want to make sure that I am kind of up with current styles and, you know, maybe somebody's tried a new method. Like, I mean, imagine, like, remember when um, Mr. Robot came out and then everybody started going for that kind of headroom, you know, yeah. that big headroom, uh, off diagonal leading line stuff. Uh, so you got to make sure that for a personal enjoyment and, um, and education that you're watching as much as you can. And then secondarily, so that you can be up to date. So then when you show up to work, you have newer things to bring to the table. Totally. So I guess that that's it, is that you have to make sure that you're not bogging yourself down all the time with uh, work and research and everything like that, so that you can come at it with a fresh set of eyes at a certain point and say, all right, I've had some time to relax. And now I'm really back in touch with uh, that innate that made me want to get into doing what we do. And so then from that point, I want to watch something new and get inspired. Are there certain steady cam operators that have very much like shaped your career as a steady cam operator as your, your motivation with steady cam? Um, well, I mean, you know, Larry McConkey, I mean, always just because the man is in his mid sixties and is still slinging it and yeah. has done everything and is tirelessly researching and creating. And that's, a, that's uh, just a, a bar that uh, I've had set in my mind where it's like, I, do, I know I'll never be a Larry McConkey, that's fine. But I want to always have that drive to just don't get complacent um, and to make sure that you're always moving forward and to try new things. Um, but yeah, in terms of, that's, that's truly, it is to just make sure that you're always kind of striving forward. Yeah. Would you say there are certain people in your career, maybe not just operators, but just, you know, anyone else on set that's really helped shape your career or like really shape the trajectory of where you are now? Yeah. Um, well, like I said, the first, uh, first person being Brett Walters, uh, who's the first AC in New York. Um, I mean, I owe my whole start to him. You know, he got me in the door and gave me a shot. And then, the ball of string just rolls out from there and you start connecting and meeting more people. Um, Adriana Brunetto, um, who's now, she's a great first. Uh, she was the second one I met her. Um, uh, Stanley and Gavin Fernandez, uh, those guys, Tim Ativier, um, Aurelia Winborn. Uh, I mean, these are a lot of assistants and then Operator wise, um, somebody who really helped me out in terms of just getting a shot is Andy Vogley. Um, Cause he and I were always friendly when I was assisting for him. And um, he would, he was moving up to DP at the time and was uh, just dropping off a hothead on set one day that he was renting to our show. And, you know, we were at the breakfast truck together and we'd just BS him. And he was just like, 
like, hey, you know, I'm doing second unit of Quantico this year while I'm, I'm over there at B camera. He's like, you ready? And I was like, what do you mean? He's like, well, I'm calling you in. He's like, I'm going to bring you in to operate a few days. And so you For that stuff. For a cam or just as an operator? Both. Oh, cool. So, um, yeah, it was, it's those abilities to just, or it, it's instances like that where you're just like, wow, like, I don't know, like it's, you just try to be a good person always because I feel like that's what will come back to you, but uh, are always very thankful when things like that happen. And so a guy like Andy, um, Rob Baracci, who's uh, a DP friend of mine that I met as an assistant, um, gave me a lot of shots on <clears throat> a show that we did together called Odd Mom Out and allowed me, after I took the course for the first time, I asked him if there were some easy steady cam days. We couldn't find anybody because New York is so busy. Uh, can I handle a simple walk and talk? And I showed him my little reel that I had and he said, yeah, sure. You know, I, I trust you. We've become friends because I was the only assistant for two cameras on season one. So I was the only second for A and B camera. So I just busted my hump. And um, so he recognized that and I never complained. Um, and so then he was like, absolutely. I'm willing to give you a shot because of what you've done for me already. And I, I see the yeah. drive. Um, yeah. I mean, th those are just uh, some names to, to throw a few out there. I mean, we're, we're so fortunate. There's so many amazing people in our business. So it's just, it's always really cool to see how it's all connected. You know, if anything, I, I'm really only a little under like three years with the local 600. Mm -hmm. um, but in that time, it's really amazing to see how all these people know each other from what projects, you know, and I think, what was it? Maybe it was January or February this year. I was day playing and ran into Adriana, you know, and it was just so cool when you, you meet people on set and you know of them or you've heard their name and then maybe your company moving or something and you start having a conversation just like this. And I'm like, wow, you know, all these people too, or you think about that guy the same way. Isn't that guy yeah. so nice? <laughs> like those moments, you know, that's again, part of what I miss about set, you know, is those human yeah. Well, because it's such a fraternity what we do you know fraternity sorority however you want to think of it but i mean yeah. it's a its own collective of people right that yeah. are it's it's almost like the military where it's a shared set of experiences that nobody else can really identify mm -hmm. with other than us and it's always yeah. you know the funny thing when i try to bring jokes home uh and you know i'll tell my wife a set joke and she yeah. make it more of a grip or a teamster or an electrician and she's just like ah. <laughs> But that same thing, I've met people yeah. falling out of their chairs, like that's a great, you know, everybody's got a couple of those dumb jokes like that, but it, do, it only resonates with our world, you know, yeah. and that's it, is it's such a unique place that it is, when you're removed from it for so long, you're like, oh man, like, that really is its own little special universe that not a lot of people understand. Yeah, I want to say early in quarantine, what was it, uh, my boyfriend and I were watching House, mm -hmm. and uh, there's, I think online now, I'm not sure if it, how it was released in real time, but there was this like behind the scenes where like Hugh Laurie kind of helped direct and curate this like homage to his crew. And like, it was just so funny because one, it was just like so sweet to see, you know, an actor care and it, as if that's such a novelty, but to, to see that was made. And then honestly, at the time it was like, it was like too bittersweet. Like we had to pause. We like couldn't watch it all because we're like, oh, remember walkies? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you remember like those sets where it's like, oh yeah, I remember the other side of that wall. Like it's just it's such an odd moment of being like, like that was like so like it's one thing to watch a TV show or a movie. Be like, oh that you know I really haven't seen that. I'm glad I I finally had the time to watch it. And yeah. it was an another thing to be like, I've never been like homesick for an 18 hour day with free crafty and you know oh exactly <laughs> which is probably a thing of the past for the next <laughs> yeah speaking <laughs> of mixed nuts <laughs> sealed. here's your sandwich here's your bag of chips go yep. away never miss crafty so much um yeah. yeah but i was wondering if you could you know address that elephant or mixed nut in the room and talk about what you think our world's gonna look like if when we get back to it yeah, well, I mean, it's all trending in the right direction now because everyone has voiced their eagerness to get back to work. And I, I mean, I'm one of them. I've, I would love to get back and, and see my people like you, like we've been talking about and just do what we do because it's a, it's a lot of fun. 
Um, but it's definitely going to be different. Um, I think it's going to function a lot like when you have an intimate scene, um, that it'll be a lot more close set like where it's just going to be essential personnel, operators, dolly grips, boom up. Um, and then if, depending on your first assistant's taste, if he or she likes to just pull off the monitor, then that's fine, keep them removed from set, but if they need to be in the room also so that they can see distances and things like that, then I think that that's, then that would be probably where you cut it off, right? And then you'd have Director's Village removed. And I think that from, from what it sounds like, that between the white paper and what 600 sent out is that that's kind of gonna be the status quo, is more this close set type of environment um, and I think that they were saying masks when we're within six feet of talent. Um, so just making sure that you have that other tool, just like, you know, when you have a, your chest pouch or your, your hip pouch, you know, with a set of scissors or an Allen wrench or something like that, you know, you always just have, have, have to have that tool with you. Um, and then sort of this idea of block light shoot being much more strict. You know, I think that we'll come in Marking rehearsal, the first one's going to be weird. I don't know how yeah. we're going to do that. They're talking about like a witness camera. We're waiting for seconds to come in and lay marks afterwards. And there's certain shows where that'll fly. And then there's going to be certain directors and TPs that have a very um, curated and specific look. So it needs to be that way every time. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that'll be the interesting one is that first marking rehearsal. I don't know what that's going to be like when it was, yeah. you know, you had a private, you had a private rehearsal, and then you had a, your marking rehearsal. When then you go from, um, you know, eight people on set, let's say, for the private rehearsal, to then you know, 30, 40 people on set, which now they're probably going to have to make it even fewer and make it, you know, it's probably going to be just your gaffer, just your key grip, the operators, the DP, the sound mixer, and the boom op, and probably a representative from hair, makeup, and wardrobe. Uh, just so that everybody has a chance to see what's going on, and then your second assistants and your first assistants. Um, or maybe they just have, like, instead of A and B camera showing up, maybe it's just A camera goes in. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I don't know. It'll be tough, but I think that that'll kind of be it. Is that you have yeah. this close set style of shooting, um, and then when we do turnarounds and things like that, I think it'll be, you know, more of the, all right, well, all right, we're going to turn around, town will step off, move the cameras to the other side. We have our, we already have our angles pre-chosen. All right, cameras are set. All right, operators and dolly grips, let's move out. Let's have everybody else come in while the cameras are kind of set up as witness cameras almost. We relight. Second team is in masks. Um, yeah, I feel like that'll kind of be it. It'll, it seems like that we'll daisy chain stuff a little bit more. That'll be, all right, one department, do your work. All right, that department clear out and sets vacant at this point. You know? Yeah. Oh, now the grips come in. All right, grips clear out. Now the electricians come in. All right, electricians clear out. Yeah. Props, hair, makeup. You know, everybody gets their turn. But that era of like, all right, turn it around. And then everybody comes in and just quickly makes their adjustments. And then we're ready to go on the other side. It's there, the days will be longer. Or at least I think the schedules will have to be probably like a week longer than yeah. they intended because they're also talking about 10 hour days um, being the new standard. Uh, because again, it's also uh, a safety, a safety standpoint too, where, you know, if you're working 14 hours a day, every day, your body itself just gets exhausted and opens you up to illness a little bit more, totally. which is why winter times, especially in New York, you know, when you work these longer than hours, you would get sicker faster. I feel like because you know, you're, you're just gassed on a 10 hour turnaround. So that I think that this will actually hopefully be a silver lining again of COVID is that it will give us more humane working hours and more humane turnaround hours. And so I think <laughs> in the long run, it'll be nicer because hopefully if they just will make up for what we would lose for that, you know, that shorter schedule, longer hours will make the money will be about the same if we do, you know, a week longer with regular hours, 10 hour days. So that's yeah. my, my broad strokes, I guess. No, it's exciting. It's, it's interesting to see what ways we can innovate how we work in other ways that it, it's just kind of like frustrating to know that it's not going to be the same, but it, it's just got to be different, you know? Yeah. I mean, have you thought at all what it'd be like 
operating and having either your your face in the eyepiece or holding a rig while wearing a mask or while wearing gloves or something like is that going through your mind at all no for my, i mean the glove aspect not really because it's my equipment and so i know it's either going to be my my assistance or um or myself that's touching the camera nobody else will be touching it but i mean we'll do i think that they're talking about four hour cleaning breaks every here and there yeah um, but no, in the eyepiece, I mean, I, you know, I always uh, respect and trust my camera assistants that, you know, that they would do like if the protocol is new eyepiece every so often that that would happen or new IP chamois that that would, that that would happen. Yeah. And if I have to wear a mask um, while I'm uh, on a dolly, that's not a big deal. It would be a little tougher with the rig, especially depending on how grueling the scene would be for myself, just because yeah. you're hurting yourself more. Um, but so I would have to kind of figure it out that if, uh, if I fall within that six foot ability to kind of keep myself unmasked, I would prefer that. But if that's gotta be the, um, the protocol moving forward, that's what it's gotta be, you know, just because we all want to get back to work. Right. But we all have to make sure that we do it responsibly. We're not breaking the rules so that everybody can stay as healthy and safe as possible so that we can all continue to work. And then we yeah. won't have to necessitate a secondary shutdown of who knows how long. Yeah, I think that's the part that's really hard to digest, but that's the like the sustainable aspect of it. You know, like the stricter we are, the longer we can sustain whatever the changes we need to make are, the longer we can all keep working. Because that would be, I think, I mean, at least that's what they're projecting. Is it could be even more devastating if a second wave comes or if we actually all, like the industry comes back, but then we have to shut down again. That's like a whole other scenario yeah. that we don't, no one really wants to imagine. But Yeah, and I mean, you know, the whole other aspect is insurance. How do we insure these jobs now? You know, I th it sounds as if there, are we going to sign waivers that say that we are knowingly entering into a COVID uh, yeah. of unpredictability and... You know, but I know that there's now paid sick leave for everybody, which is smart because it'll now curb everybody's need to feel like they just have to push through. Um, and that you won't have to, there won't be that pressure of, you know, oh, if I, if I take a day off, do I lose my job? You know, because somebody else comes in. It's like, no, it's not going to be a replacement scenario. It's just going to be, this is somebody that's going to be like a stopgap for you if somebody does have to get sick and leave. And also I think that that's, almost a bonus because then it encourages somebody to be responsible about not spreading the virus. And also it gives somebody else an opportunity to come in and get exposure and get work, right? Where maybe they wouldn't have in the past. Totally. We will see. So, yeah. <laughs> well, I know that I could just talk to you for hours, but <laughs> um, <laughs> I was wondering if maybe we could conclude our lovely chat with sure. any uh, maybe advice or suggestions you have for either um, younger people in our industry or people mm -hmm. that I almost like feel bad to say like want to get into our industry and now is the time that they thought they would try like if there's any like piece of advice you'd want to give the world right now yeah um, is uh, thoughtful persistence I guess is the way I, I like to look at it is that you know, when you're, when you want something, right, you want to give it your all and throw yourself at it, but you also want to do it that isn't, uh, that doesn't seem desperate in a way, you know, so like if you're somebody that's uh, a PA, right, and you want to get in touch with, you want to do camera, you want to do electric, you want to talk to a DP or something like that, know when is a good window, you know, read the room, have the ability to read a room and know yeah. when things are appropriate to approach somebody. Um, I, I always feel like that that's something that I would love to try. You can't teach that ability, but for people to try to hone that, hone the ability to read a room, because I think it really helps you while you're trying to network and navigate the, the production world that we're in. Um, and that always don't feel, or don't feel afraid to network either. Reach out to people because this is an industry where nobody got anywhere by themselves. Everybody had to get helped by somebody at some point in time. Yeah. So, um, you know, if you have an operator on set and you want to operate and you're a loader, you're a camera PA, whatever, speak to that person. Say, hey, you know, I would love to pick your brain when there's an appropriate time just because I'm also trying to learn if that's something that's okay with you. And again, that all comes back into the read the room. 
yeah. like if that person just maybe isn't overall the nicest person or warm to that sort of thing then just let me all talk to the b operator or the dp is great but you know the a op or the b op one of them i don't know if i could really approach you know just having that mental um street smarts to to navigate that scenario but that um always try and network with people and, re and just reach out because the worst that could happen is a no. And that's it. And no is, is a scary word for some people sometimes, but you got to realize that you'll hear it a bunch and that a bunch of no's will lead to one yes. And then those yeses become a contact and then that contact becomes multiple contacts and it just kind of spider webs out from there. Um, so yeah, to just, Try not to be uh, too shy about it. Don't be overly aggressive about it. Um, but use any and all um, network connections that you have and make them work for you in a way that you can generate more names and then, you know, kind of build your tree from there. Well, thank you so much for your time and your yeah. lovely stories. And I also just want to say that you. You look like you're in like this lovely warm light and it looks like you somehow like have oh nice light you got a little lamp that I put here because she had to be doing all these zoom calls for work so yeah a particular studio setup that you got here it's good <laughs> yeah I've, I've I've thought a lot about how the light is affecting the interviews I'm like oh wow I've never felt so pale next to my apartment. <laughs> I tried to use like nice natural light, but it think it's just coming off as like. I mean, the only reason it looks like I have any sort of like, cause you know me, I'm, I'm as pale as a ghost like you, but I have a red shirt on hitting with a soft light. So I feel like, oh, okay, great. It looks like I actually have a pulse. Yeah, I definitely don't feel like I have a pulse today, but <laughs> I just wanted to acknowledge that. <laughs> well, thank well, you. I'm going to, stop recording now of course. this has been lovely I will. oh this has been great too thank yeah. you <laughs>